Uh, okay. So, hello everyone. Thank you for joining me uh, to the fourth annual conference of Global Psychiatric Association, the Young Researcher Forum. Forum. I'm really thankful for the opportunity. So, my name is Dr. Sarobi Chatterjee. I'm a first year postgraduate in psychiatry from Ames, and I'll be talking about the student mental health amid the global crisis. So when we talk about crisis, there are several ways of looking at it. Particularly pertaining to my topic, we'll be first focusing upon wars. When we talk about wars, we usually focus upon the physical warfare that most of us are aware of. But wars can be defined in various ways. It can be in terms of scale, like the global wars, which are fought over different countries uh, across different continents, like we had the World War I and World War II. It can be in the basis of regions which are concentrated around specific countries, like the Middle Eastern conflicts that we faced, specifically the ones between Israel, Iran that we are even facing today. Then the civil wars, which are usually internal conflicts which happen within a country, like the Sri Lankan civil war. It can be in terms of methodology, the conventional warfare, which are usually by using the cavalry, the infantry, the regular army troops and the traditional battles. One of the common examples that we give is the world wars. Then the next is the guerrilla warfare, which is usually a form of asymmetrical warfare, which is usually taken part by small groups, like the Vietnam War, where we saw that usually the people who live in specific, particularly geographical terrains, like the Vietnam War, where the people of Vietnam fought and fought extensively over the enormous troops in, of America and led it to victory. Then we have a new kind of warfare that is emerging these days, called as the cyber warfare, where the war does not happen in terms of the physical realm that we all are aware of, but rather it's a hijack into the cyber space. It can be both state-sponsored as well as non-state-sponsored hacking. There have been numerous countries, including the attack of China on India and several other countries as well, where there was important information that is usually taken over by one country to another. Then one of the other weapons that we are now thinking about and one that has been hugely discussed upon, whether we may agree or we may not agree, but we know that biological weapons can be used as weapons of mass destruction. Like the, one of the recent examples of COVID-19, has taken lives of more than more people than any kind of wars ever have. Next, we come upon to the duration. Wars can be short-term conflicts, which are really intense battles like the Gulf War. They can be protracted wars, which are long-lasting conflicts, which cause immense amount of stress, anxiety, and lots of social problems, which usually last for a lot of period of time, like we saw in the Afghanistan war, the Afghanistan-America war, and re recently the Taliban takeover. There's another form of violence and crisis that each of the countries are facing right now, one that is called as workplace violence and one that is even the term of this year's mental health day to reduce to improve the uh, mental health in our workplaces and all of us being doctors being mental health professionals around we may or may not have ourselves been prone to workplace violence so we'll be talking about the workplace violence that india has now come across and india is fighting for it While we talk about any war or crisis, on the basis of the nature of the harm, we usually only tend to look at the direct harm any war causes, the direct afflicts of the people, the direct casualties, people, the troops, the civilians who were directly afflicted by the effects of the war. What we often overlook is the indirect harm that these warfares cause. The indirect harm usually have a very protracted and longer course and they impair your action your coping strategies your future learning opportunities along with having economic deprivation so if we look overall at the traumatization or the victimization pattern we can see 
that direct victimization usually affects people who are direct participants. What we often overlook are the communities which may not be directly involved, but of the neighboring countries, the neighboring ethnicities, the displaced populations usually in a very higher range than the normal populations who were actually afflicted with the war. They even can be individuals who are not in direct conflict zones, but they are affected because of the displacement, because of turning migrants to another countries. The consequences of the direct victimization are often studied. We talk about the physical disability which affect people for lifelong. We even have so many veteran systems in different parts of the country where we help the veterans who have received physical disability and we work for their rehabilitation. There's one of the very important aspect of post-traumatic stress disorder that we, that we usually focus upon while we are working with direct victims. As compared to that, indirect victims usually face the consequence of chronic poverty. People who have already lost all of their uh, work, all of whatever they have earned over the years behind, and they come and migrate to a different country. They have lost whatever they have earned. It might be in terms of education. It might be in terms of lands, properties. Everything is disrupted and they're uprooted from their own niche to another country and are forced to acclimatize themselves to whichever country they are forced to. Next, we talk about educational disruption and why this is a very important topic in terms of student mental health. Most of the students may be primary care students, higher education students. Each one of us undergo through the educational disruption. And as a part of the student community, I very well know that how much does it affect people. They can even be impact of the lasting societal instability, which can affect us over a prolonged period of time. Then lack of access to basic living and intergenerational trauma even causing hatred of our different ethnic groups over the period of the years. That is often overlooked when we looked at the aspects of trauma. Some of the main aspects of primary traumatization after 2019, which I would like to focus is, for example, in COVID-19, it's estimated that by 2021 around, 616 million students were affected by full or partial school closure. More than half of these students, especially the students who were affected by full school closure in developing countries and underdeveloped countries, never got access to complete their education thereafter. In Syria, for example, after 11 years of war and civil unrest in Syria, the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic crisis, it is expected that more than 2.4 million students are out of school. The Taliban's discriminatory ban on Afghanistan has been depriving 1.4 million girls of their right to education. There's huge psychological and emotional toll on Afghan girls. Their hopes, their futures have been burned in front of their eyes. Then we come upon the Sri Lankan civil war. Chances of children completing their upper secondary or higher education in Sri Lanka, which was considered a few years back as one of the most literate countries in the world, has decreased by around 97.2 percentage points. And even educational attainment has decreased by around three and a half years. The global outrage on the Ukraine-Russia Ukraine war, which started on the February 24th, uh, 2022, uh, roughly around a year after when a study was done, it was found that as per the government tolls, around 461 children had been killed, around more than 3,000 educational institutes damaged, and more than $600 million worth of educational infrastructure was destroyed. There were so many things, so many museums, and so many specific things to the country that cannot be returned back. Here, I would like to focus that though we are just talking in terms of numbers and people, but we have to look beyond numbers. We have to understand that each one of them has been an individual person. And one person who has been affected by the primary traumatization has even affected 10 times more number of people who were associated with them in a direct or an indirect way that we are overlooking or who have developed any forms of anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues, and will develop it over the coming years.
So this is an example of the whatever has happened over 1989. And as we can see that except Rwanda, most of the other countries, be it Ukraine, Nigeria, Ethiopia, there has been an uprise from 2020 to 2023 and the number of deaths that has happened due to the armed conflicts. Now, when we focus upon a year full of wars, 2020 is considered that there have been deadliest conflicts around the world. In specific regions around the world, there have been, for example, in South Africa, the reported 6,700 deaths. In Middle Eastern countries, there's 19,000 deaths in each of the countries. But if we look upon COVID-19 as death, nearly more than 10 times the amount of people who were affected by all of the deaths in 2020, 18.8 million people till 2020 end was affected with COVID understand that what can be the implication if biological weapons are used here, here and then after. Now we look about each of the important crises and why they are very important and how they are distinguished from each other. First, yeah, we look... Move, speaker. First, we look about Afghanistan. The Afghanistan, the girls and women education. So currently, if we see in the infographic, we can see that around 80% of school-aged Afghan girls and young women, which total about 2.5 million people, are out of school as per the UNESCO. The Taliban's decision to keep the schools shut have reversed all the gains that Afghanistan had acquired over the past 20 years. And this can be compared to the pre-2001 era, when more than half of the population of Afghanistan, especially women, could not even learn to understand and write their own names. Primary education, if we compare primary Upper secondary and upper secondary education, we can see that the immense impact on upper secondary education. Females after 2001 were gradually trying to learn and trying to get into superior positions, trying to get into basic education and the access to a better future by at least getting into upper secondary classes. But all of this has been disrupted after 2020. The employment rate in the workforce was also significantly, unemployment rate has also de significantly decreased. For female, it's 16.8% as compared to 10.5%. But as of now, we can see that more than half of the population and sometimes nearly around 75% of the women's population is out of the workforce. We'll first focus upon the Taliban's restriction. Since the Taliban took control in 2021, over its spread across 40 degrees, they have been issued restricting girls' access. They first started with limiting them in upper secondary and higher education, moved on to lower secondary, and finally, they have restricted all forms of education for women. As of now, only 3% of Afghan girls have received secondary education, and most girls have been barred. There have been immense amount of university exclusion. Women have been excluded from all forms of higher education which has limited their career prospects. And women who were on the verge of getting their degree have not been given their degrees. The prior gains that were made have been lost. The broader humanitarian crisis has often been overlooked, which is driven not just by the decreased amount of education in women, but which will increase the amount of uh, ignorance driven by poverty, conflict, which will exacerbate the difficulties in maintaining the access to education because a woman who learns will also provide better education opportunities for her entire family. There have been immense teacher shortages as well because most of the qualified female teachers have now been banned from working. So not just women, but also the men and uh, boys have been severely affected because of the decreased teacher student ratio. There has been an international community, including UNESCO, has condemned Taliban, but it has limited, but it has not caused any benefits till now. There is also a huge rural urban divide, which we can see. The educational access was already disparate between rural and urban areas, but with all the humanitarian progress in the urban areas and the limited access to the rural areas, 
the rural regions have suffered most of the logistical challenges and there have been increased amount of conservative norms with children with child marriages for young girls the psychological impact has been restricted most of the studies that were being done have been restricted to come out from the region due to heightened level of due to heightened taliban crime rates so many uh, journalists have not been able to publish their reports they not been able to tell what is the actual outcry of the people over there young girls and their families they have all been torn out there have been heightened amount of psychological distress that is expected so if we see over the timeline we can see that how after taliban once it started with gender segregated rooms then it moved on to asking women to stay at home then parks gyms were made unavailable finally it was made unavailable for women to work in gyms and in ngos as well university attendance was prohibited from december 2021 onwards and as of 2023 it has been more rigid more conservative the islamic hijab has been made mandatory so female doctors and health workers are asked to cover their faces with mask and observe the complete islamic hijab at all times even during surgical procedures this has been taken from one of the studies that was done by sayed hussain agha lemi et al in 2024 which was titled i felt my life's achievements burning before my eyes the impact of the taliban's ban on female education and on afghan female students the findings of the study stated that more the afghan female student perceived that their decree by the taliban was as ideological attempt to introduce gender based discrimination and the psychological complications for afghan female student include around 80% of anxiety depression despair isolation and loneliness and i do all of these students are actually studying right now in china universities most of these female students are now not in contact with their own families back home furthermore it was also indicated by the study that there is high amount of insecurity and uncertainty and most of them have chose not to ever return to afghanistan and seek for permanent asylum in wherever whichever country they are studying in this case china we can see that in 1960s this was one of the pictures that had went actually a very famous the 1960 shows a much a much famous and much modern afghanistan as compared to the 2020s if the female employment in afghanistan you can see a sharp decline in the female employment ratio which is reduced as less as even less than 70% index ratio now the cost of taking away the girls education apart from just the number of girls who are out of secondary education it has even costed the afghan economy around 5.4 billion dollars because girls can't complete their secondary education and enter the job market which is roughly around 26.8% of afghan's gdp if we compare in 2004 only 6% and we can see that just in 14 years there was around six times increase in the amount of enrollment and the amount that these females were contributing now we move on to the other crisis that we are facing the silent sirin cry this is also one of the very famous pictures which was taken which shows a girl who was actually studying in her school and was affected off by the sirin bombings so if we see in syria as well there's widespread trauma among children and adolescents around 5 million children have been affected by the conflict there has been immense amount of anxiety and depression as heightened as even 40% of anxiety and depression reported among young children there's also high incidence of ptsd around 50% of syrian refugee children in their host countries are said to have ptsd because of the direct exposure to the immense amount of violence they have faced over the conjuring 11 years education has been disrupted for most of the people most of the educational institutions and the books have already been burned 
There's already 2.4 million children for whom the education will never be provided and they'll always be uprooted. There's also an increase in the suicide. Reports have indicated that suicide rates among Syrian youth living in refugee camps are one of the highest in the entire refugee community. Roughly one in five Syrians, especially students, have experienced mental health disorders such as depression and anxiety. And they feel the need for people to come across and help them because there is not enough resources in their country and in their refugee camps to address the mental health crisis. The prolonged exposure to toxic stress has even disrupted neurodevelopment in children. There has been long-term intellectual disability, cognitive and emotional difficulties in these students. There is also an increase in the school dropouts in Syrian children. The resilience and coping interventions have been tried even by the WHO, the UNICEF, and by the doctor support group to integrate mental health support in their educational system. But most of it has been limited to a very small group. These are just some of the numbers. The 89% of children have become more fearful and 50% of adolescents are turning to drugs to cope up with the stress. 80% of the children have become more aggressive, aggressive than their other counterparts who are developing normally in other countries. And 71% of the children have been suffering from bedwetting and involuntary urination as a part of it. Even young children, as much as 48%, have lost the ability to speak and have developed serious impediments as a result of the ongoing Syria's war. Now we move on to another uprising. In 2024, Bangladesh experienced the student uprising. There was significant student-led protest addressing the issue of job inequality and corruption. Bangladesh usually followed a quota system which reserved half of its well-paid service post job for specific groups, especially people who worked hard for the 1971 War of Independence from Pakistan. So we can say that only 44% of the total system was based on merit. This caused severe outrage among people that had been boiling over the ongoing 30 years. As per, the, as per right now, more than 200 people have been reportedly killed during the student protest highlighting the severity of the government response to the civil unrest. Over 2,500 individuals have been arrested because of the widespread student protest. The protest was motivated by the deep-seated grievances of the job crisis, which affects around 12% of young people in Bangladesh. Bangladesh, being one of the developing countries, between, has one of the largest population of people aged between 15 to 29 years and less jobs for them meant that they were going to face severe crisis both physically as well as mental health wise. The job benefited only a small percentage of the population, the freedom fighters, which led to resentment and the public sentiment gave rise to because of the disillusion, disillusionment which affected them. It was led by the ruling Awami League government and many believed that it was entrenched both in corruption as well as in nepotism, which drove out the working prime minister of the country. There was immense amount of youth population, which indicated a shift in the political engagement because we could see that more and more younger generations were trying to reclaim their voice in the political landscape. The political dynamics saw an unprecedented rise because students from diverse backgrounds from the very first time were coming together and fighting against the authoritarian governance. The government in place deployed heavy military and used heavy handed tactics, which underscored the severity of the political crisis. There was, despite the notable economic growth in Bangladesh, the growing inequality led to around 37% of depression. Most of it is because of unemployment in the country's youth, aged between 15 to 29. The future implications could change the political landscape and could further shift the power dynamics. 
These are some of the pictures of the violent student protests and how the military was employed. Now we move on to work upon the civil unrest in Sri Lanka and the effect of the civil war. The civil war in Sri Lanka has seen multiple civil wars over the ongoing past 50 years. The current political turmoil post-civil war was after the end of 2009. The instability had already been there, but it severely increased after the effect of COVID. And the instability has still continued into 2024. There were still underlying ethnic tensions between the two groups, the, major, the majority and the minority Tamilians group. The political landscape was increasingly unstable because of the resignation of the president, Mr. Rajpaksha. The economic challenges that Sri Lanka faced was a severe crisis in 2021. Around 75% of the households reported a reduction in their income, affecting the educational expenses. Even the Sri Lankan currency faced depravity and it had to ask for multiple loans, India being one of the countries that provided one of the major amounts of money to help Sri Lanka. The mental health crisis increased among students. Most of the students working in higher education, their university education was stopped or they could not continue because the normal ongoing activities of daily living were severely impaired by the civil unrest. There was a rise in anxiety, depression, and even suicidal ideation, particularly among those who were directly affected by the protest and had lost their loved ones. Human right abuses were documented during the protest, including both police brutality and the arbitrary attest, arrests. There was immense amount of fear among students. Their academic performance was impaired. It is notable to say that around 40% of, men, of healthcare professionals have already left the country as a result of the civil unrest. There was also disruption of the educational institutions leading to significant learning losses. There's increased amount of migration trends now among youth, young people. Most of the Sri Lankans are seeing opportunities overseas and the amount of young population remaining in Sri Lanka is severely less, is significantly less. The government's response to dissent has been by imposing curfews and increasing the amount of normal everyday items. They have also limited freedom. So as a response to that, several civil society organizations and student groups have come up. They have become increasingly vocal in advocating for their rights and needs. And that has played a crucial role in mobilizing the protest. The constant exposure to the political violence and the economic despair has resulted in long-term psychological aspects, including PTSD and intergenerational trauma among people who belong to the minority community. There's an immense need for political stability and an immense need for the entire world to intervene for betterment of Sri Lanka. Now we move on to another country, the Gaza. The world had its eyes on Gaza because the Gaza unrest had been ongoing for several years now, as much has been documented since 200 years. We all know that it was over a small strip of land called as the Gaza Strip, which was initially captured from Egypt in 1967. In 2005, Israel had pulled out its troops and settlers, but and taken part of West Bank and East Jerusalem. And now the Gaza Strip was under the control of Palestinians. The West Bank and the East Jerusalem, on the other hand, was captured from Jordan in 1967. And Israel continued to control most of the West Bank area and supported the settlements of the people who occupied that place. For this small strip of land, Gaza, there was immense amount of fight over both areas. Israel and Palestinians both fought for this area. Now, what it resulted in was high rates of mental health issues. As much as 53% of Israeli high school students reported that there was daily mental or emotional distress. Around 66 
6% of students had experienced decline in their academic performance as a result of the stress and trauma linked to the war. Around the same number of people said that they were having repeated images, including the graphic images, as causing them to have panic attacks, especially those of the October 7. The recent conflict led to a sharp increase in the PTSD prevalence. Around hundreds and thousands of Palestinians and Israelis, including students, were at risk of developing it. The social isolation that it caused and the family that was disrupted in several parts of Gaza led to children being isolated from their parents. Despite the mental health challenges, 76% of students still felt that they had a sense of maturity and an obligation to serve their country in, on either sides during the conflict. Both, as per as Israel was concerned, they acknowledged the need for additional resources and started including mental health as a part of their curriculum, emphasizing the importance of resilience. Most of the infrastructure which was present in Gaza was already disrupted to develop any sort of infrastructure further. The studies also indicated that the exposure related to war trauma has caused immense increase in substance abuse and aggressive behavior among both Israeli as well as Gazan youth. There was also critical need for parents, but parents were nowhere to be found because most of them were already dead. There was also community support initiative where efforts were being made within communities and educational institutions to support both these communities. As of now, in 2024, recently, we are seeing an increased amount of attacks from both Israel and Iran side. There has been escalating military tensions, direct and indirect conf confrontation from either side, domestic pressure in Iran, which has forced their leadership to perceive Israeli aggression and influence their military strategies. What has it resulted in? Immense amount of student mental health decline. The amount of, in both the sides, Iran and Israel, Israel, because of the ongoing conflicts with Palestine, as well as Iran, most of the Israeli students are now seeking asylum abroad. They are now looking for opportunities outside their country and are looking for never coming back into their country. There have been severe educational disruption, both in the learning microenvironment and the access to education. There's also a growing need for psychosocial support services, but in countries like Iran, it's very limited. The international responses have called for de-escalation and dialogue, but the ongoing tension is still continuing. Now we move on to the greatest impact of our time, the impact, the pandemic, which left no country. COVID-19 pandemic had a large and uneven impact on global mental health. There were sharp increase in major depressive disorders and anxiety disorders. The baseline cases increased by around one to two folds because of COVID-19. And as we can see, the younger population were the hardest hit because most of them were not at all, were working tirelessly in place of elderly and were also getting the caregiver burden. We can see that between the ages of 25 to 39, most of the population was affected with major depressive disorder and anxiety disorder. And this increase was particularly higher among females. Around 35.5 million female as compared to 17.7 .7 million male, as per the study done by Santa Moro DF et al, showed that uh, major depressive disorders and anxiety disorders were one to two folds higher in females. Now, what about the teen mental health, which is often overlooked? On comparing that in the National Poll on Children's Health 2021, we saw that around 36%, most of the girls have been affected by anxiety and depression, whereas most of the males were now showing aggressive behavior and were withdrawn from their family. This has been a growing trend that parents have even noticed and it is still persisting till now. The immense amount of social isolation, about 66% of students feeling socially isolated, a new kind of isolation which was not low earlier, caused by 
distance learning, the remote learning, the social isolation, which contributed to the increased mental health struggle. There was decreased amount of institutional support, especially in developing countries. Many of the universities, though, started including mental health resources and started with their telepsychiatry services. Nearly around 25 to 30 percent of institutions still did not have the support initially. As far as 50 percent of institutions globally even started virtual counseling services. The access to mental health and the importance of mental health increased severely during the COVID time. Most of the people, roughly 34% of students, were now talking about mental health. Most came to know about words like depression, anxiety, as young as the age of eight or nine years. And now they could have access to mental health resources. The pandemic was the hardest hit for the marginalized groups in the population. There was different marginalized groups in different population, me it be sexual minorities, economic minorities, ethnic minorities. These were the people who were hardest hit and had higher level of distress. The post pandemic recovery, even years later, it's been, four, it's been three to four years and still the studies reveal that as much as 72% of students, especially students of higher education who could not complete their degree and were forced to return from the country where they first started their education, is still face immense, immense amount of mental health challenges. Both has a direct impact of COVID and the physical challenges of long COVID, as well as the psychological impact. There was eight. So now experts are calling for further research so that we can prevent any further pandemic and also act upon the long term impact of COVID-19 so that we can take better decisions for students' mental health. Moving on to another country, Ukraine, the Ukraine and Russia war in 2022. We saw that as much as 18 public, private universities and schools, there had been immense dropout in the enrollment rates and the disruption of their classes. More than half of Ukraine's 7.5 million children have been displaced by the war, and 2.8 million of them are internally displaced, and around half of them are without parents. Around 350 billion is the cost that it will take to restore the infrastructure that has already been destroyed. 15 to 25% of adults have PTSD and complex PTSD. Even when the study was done by McClory et al. in assessing the children's mental health in a sample of population between 8 to 12 years of old, we saw that depression, anxiety, and the pre-morbid indicators of PTSD and all the seven indicators of internalizing and externalizing and attention problems of the PSC-17 scale was present. There was increased problems with most of the part in the internalizing domain, particularly depression and anxiety and the early features were being shown by children as young as eight years old, with 35% of the parents reported that their child worried more since the beginning of the war because of the isolation and the increased amount of changes in their environment. There was also another side of students who had already went to Ukraine. We saw that Indian medical students, nearly 18,000 of the medical students had to be evacuated and lifted up by air along with countries, medical students from other nationalities in 2022. Around 70% of evacuated students were now already transferred to other country colleges in different countries using Serbia, Kyrgyzstan, Georgia. But even then, 30% of these students were still facing their depravity and had lost their medical education forever. 20,000 students who were enrolled in Georgia uh, were even facing the crisis as most of it, as some of them were not having the financial resources. We can see that as much as 80%, 81% of the students said that they were feeling anxious even after returning back to their own country because of the stressors of their exam, the studies, what will happen to the result, will be they ever be given the certificate of their medical education or whatever higher degrees that they were seeking. Now we move on to another aspect and the global 
aspect that is now seeking highlight and it's emanating from the country India. After talking much about students and how students' mental health is being affected, we need to talk about doctors. We need to talk about mental health professionals, about us particularly. In 2024, the, the doctors in India, they've organized a protest which has run all across the country and has now even reached globally for an incident that took place in one of the most famous medical colleges in Kolkata, which is a metro city in the country. Herein, a female postgraduate trainee doctor was found dead, uh, raped and murdered in her own campus. This event led to shockwaves across the medical community and highlighted the systemic issues that were affecting doctors' mental health across the country. There was increased amount of stress levels that was reported directly and indirectly as a result of this incident. Around 67% of doctors were reporting moderate stress and over 90% of these 67% had experienced burnout because of their immense postgraduate training. The prevalent violence against the medical professionals has exacerbated their own mental health. Many doctors are now expressing fear while going to work. There have also been long working hours, longer shifts with inadequate rest. 16.7% doctors have reported suicidal thoughts, which shows the severity of the mental health crisis. And there's immense fear among female doctors regarding their work environment. The morale and the duty conflict, the dilemma of fulfilling your own duty while advocating for yourself is now most of us are worrying about. The fear is palpable. What we hope for is a change, a change where we can feel safe in our working conditions. And there is a growing recognition for the need to reform and work for better discussion on work environments. As per different studies, which one of them I have been a part of, there have been reported anxiety disorders in college students, especially in different conflict zones, as higher as 20% depression, 15 to 30 percent PTSD over different regions of the world and suicidal ideation. One of the often overlooked things is the substance use disorders and the implication of it over the coming years, which is prevalent in 10 to 20 percent of the college students directly as a result of a coping mechanism for the trauma that they have gone through. I end my presentation by this quote by Rashid Ogunlaru. It's odd how we focus on studying wars at school to form our education. No wonder we as adults know so li little about making and forging peace as ones. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Surabhi Chatterjee for a nice presentation. Uh, you have given a very good statistics about different wars how they have started and uh, uh, what is the impact of uh, wars on different groups of population. Uh, but as far as I am concerned that your topic was a student's mental health among global crises. So in the last slides, uh, in the last slide, you only showed what are the mental health problems among students. In the rest of the slides, you were talking uh, in general about the uh, impact of war on different aspects in different populations, right? So uh, you, I think uh, you should have focused that uh, uh, because the mental health problems are there, but after global crisis, what are the mental health issues which are emerging, how they can be managed, uh, that should have been the focus of the your presentation as far as I am concerned. And now the session is open for uh, questions. Uh, if anybody is interested to have any uh, put any question they can go go ahead i can only speak from my personal experience i'm uh indian born and raised in the uk when we see violence in the media on tv the, to deal with the anxiety and depression we just have to switch off the tv that's the only way to cope as a coping mechanism okay anybody else wants to give his uh, comments 
Um, I can answer it. Um, so it might be easier for some people to just shut off their TV, but for some people and most of the people, the ongoing unrest and when you are a part of that conflict where or you are somehow related to the conflict, it's very difficult to just turn off or turn out from the world. It's as easy as saying that if somebody is trolling you on social media, just close your social media. It just doesn't work that way for every person because not just that every person is created different, but the amount of resilience that each person has is very different. And the amount of effect that each of the things that person is looking through media has also has different impacts on different groups of people. Okay. Satisfied uh, uh, the person who has asked, uh, uh, said about uh, uh, on and off of the TV. Uh, now I move to Dr. Sujit to proceed further. Thank you so much, sir. Now we can invite the second speaker. Uh, second